in the beginning, there was God and nothing else. The Spirit of God traveled through the abyss. Then God exclaimed, Let there be light! On the second day, God pulled the moisture from the waters of the nothingness to create the clouds and the blue skies above and the ripples of the waters below. And God said, The skies shall be called heaven. On the third day, God said, Let the gathering waters below the heavens be named the sea, and the dry land shall be named earth. With God's command, the seeds of his creation spread across the earth, blossoming into grass, flowers, and trees bearing fruit. The flourishing earth was beautiful, and God saw that his creation was good. And on the fourth day, God molded the sun, moon, and stars, and placed them in the heavens to illuminate the earth. And the days, seasons, and years began as God divided the day from night. On the fifth day, God created living creatures, saying, Let the waters, seas, and rivers be filled with an abundance of life, great whales and fish of every type, and let birds of every kind fly high above the earth. But God blessed the life below, and saw that his creations were good. The sixth day came, and God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures. And the earth was filled with all kinds of animals, untamed ones, docile ones, and ones that crawled on the earth.
began to move, and Satan, in the form of a serpent, appeared from the branches and enticed Eve. So, God told you not to eat this fruit? Oh, yes. God said that if we eat or touch it, we will die. Oh, you will not die. This fruit will give you knowledge and make you wise, like God himself. fruit affected Adam and Eve much differently than the serpent had promised. Suddenly, their innocence was taken from them for failing to obey God. Adam, we have no wisdom. We are only sinful and nude. What have we done? We must cover ourselves and hide. As Adam and Eve hurried to gather leaves to cover themselves, God suddenly appeared before them. Why did you eat the forbidden fruit that I commanded you not to touch? The woman you created for me took a bite and gave it to me. And the serpent you created deceived me and promised that it would cause us no harm. Because you defied me, you are banned from the Garden of Eden. From now on, your survival will depend upon your own hard work. God provided them with animal skins for clothing and banished Adam and Eve from the garden. As they walked away, Adam and Eve turned to take one last glimpse of the beautiful garden. Suddenly, a flaming sword appeared and blocked the entrance to Eden. We will never be able to enter the garden again. Adam, what are we going to do? And where are we going to go? The perfect bond between God and his beloved Adam and Eve was shattered. Now, with nothing but their knowledge and shame, they had to find a way to create a new life. However, God, with all his wisdom, had planned a salvation for his creation. One day I shall send a savior for your redemption. Time passed and generations grew. The earth became full of sinful people who lied, cheated, and murdered. People refused to worship God, but instead idolized the sun, moon, stars, and statues built by men. But one man stayed true to his faith. Noah looked down from the hilltop at the sinful people and prayed to God. God, how long will all this evil sin continue? Please, help us all. One night, as Noah prayed, God spoke to him. Noah, I'm sorry that I created these corrupt humans. I am pleased that you have been faithful. I want you to build an ark for you and your family. I am going to flood the earth and destroy the dishonest and cruel people of this world. Noah, now that your ark is built, I want you to gather every living thing of all flesh. Two of every kind, male and female, birds, cattle, and every creeping thing on earth you shall bring into the ark. Care for them, feed them, and keep them alive.
Suddenly, the doors of heaven opened up. The rains poured down onto the earth, and the floodwaters quickly rose. For 40 days and 40 nights, the rains poured down, and the people who refused to believe in God were lost beneath the water. All things evil were destroyed as the waters rose high above the mountains, and the earth was covered by the great flood. Noah and his family cared for the animals as the ark drifted on the waters, and the rains continued to pour down from the heavens. Shem, have you fed the animals yet? Yes, Father. I have fed the sheep and cows, and now I'm going to feed the reptiles and other animals. And I'm cleaning up after all the animals. One day, as the ark continued floating with no land in sight, as quickly as it had started, the rain abruptly stopped. Emzara, God has blessed us. The rains are no more, and the sun shines upon us once again. The months grew long as Noah and his family drifted in search of land. How long are we going to be stuck on this ark? It's been months, and there's no land in sight. Who knows how long it will be? It could be months or years before we find land. And who knows how that land will even be when we arrive. Time continued to pass. Then, one day, the ark came to rest on top of the mountains of Ararat. Noah rushed to look up and saw that the waters had begun to recede. Oh, thank you, God, for lowering the waters. Let's send out a dove to search the area. If there is more land close by, then it will not come back. Noah released the dove into the air and watched as the bird flew through the sky and vanished from sight. Hours later, Noah looked up and saw that his dove had returned. Noah, keeping his faith, sent the dove out a few days later, and this time it returned with a gift. Thank you for the olive leaf, my little friend. This means dry land is upon us once more. Seven days later, the dove was released again, but this time it never returned, as it had found a place to nest. As the waters continued to lower, Noah and his family became anxious, as they constantly looked for more signs of land. I see land! It had been over a year since the great flood had started, and Noah and his family were the only eight people to survive. Finally, they were able to leave the ark and step foot on dry land once more. This feels wonderful. The warmth of the sun beaming on my face. The softness of the grass between my toes. Oh, I have missed you so much. All that is evil has been removed from this earth. Through us, God has given humans a new beginning, and we must not fail him. We must follow his path and teach all who follow us to love and obey. Noah built an altar and thanked God for looking after him and his family. He asked God to guide them in their new journey. God gave Noah a sign that he had been heard. Look, a rainbow! I will never again destroy the earth with a flood. There will always be a day and a night, a summer and a winter, and a time to plant and harvest your crops. It's beautiful, Father. God has truly blessed us. When people see a rainbow, it will be a reminder of God and his promise that he will never destroy the entire earth again with a flood. Years after the flood, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their families moved closer to the river valley. With the growth of their families, the mountains and flatlands became dotted with the tents of shepherd villages, and the cities of the river valley grew. As the years passed, God the Creator had begun to be forgotten by the people. Hundreds of miles down the Euphrates River, they built the great trading city of Ur. The land was abundant with all the riches that people needed, but it was also filled with many different gods. 
Abram, why are you standing out here all alone at this hour? I heard God speak to me, and I feel that I must obey him. He wants me to travel to another land and leave my father's family and these false gods behind. There, he will show me how to build a great nation for our family and wants to bless all the people of Earth through me. As Abram and his followers settled in Egypt, his worst fear was realized. One day, the Pharaoh saw Sarai and immediately fell in love with her beauty. In order to save his life, Abram, with reluctance, presented themselves as brother and sister. She is the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. I shall give you all the riches you desire in exchange for your sister's hand in marriage. It's an honor to meet you, Your Majesty. With no other choice, to save Abram's life, he and Sarai played along with the Pharaoh's wishes. But before the day of the marriage, God intervened and saved his chosen family. He struck the Pharaoh with a horrible illness that eventually took his life. The people of Egypt were not happy. They blamed Abram for the Pharaoh's demise and were determined to punish him. What a foolish plan we had. I'm thankful for our escape, but can you forgive me for being such a coward? I didn't have faith in God's plan. You're my husband. Of course I forgive you. Thank you, my love. From now on, I will always put my faith in God. I pray that he will forgive me. He did protect us from the evil in Egypt, even after we forgot to trust him. I'm certain that's a sign of his forgiveness. We must always follow his path and never question his plan for us again. God will always guide us, and hopefully never again will I have to call you my brother. One day while he was resting, three strangers appeared. Abraham greeted the men and invited them to be his guests. As the strangers' visit came to an end, Abraham decided that he would walk with them for a while. Where does your journey take you now? We are headed to the city of Sodom to see why it is so full of sin and corruption. God may have to destroy it soon. Thank you. Safe travels to you all. That's where my nephew lives. 
They must be messengers of God. Abraham rushed to the altar and begged God to save his nephew and the city of Sodom. My lord, I beg that you save Sodom from destruction. Would you punish the righteous along with the sinful, even if there are only 30 or 50 good people in the city? Don't you think they are worth saving? Abraham, your faith in people is strong. I will agree to save the city of Sodom in honor of your faith, even if there are only 10 good men among them. Thank you, my lord, for blessing us all. Two of the three angels arrived at the city of Sodom, where they were greeted by Abraham's nephew Lot as they entered. Welcome to my city. Consider yourselves my guests. God has sent us here to destroy Sodom.
as the sun rose, Lot, his wife, and their two daughters followed the angels through the gates and away from the city of Sodom. Suddenly behind them, the city burst into flames. Keep running and don't look back. If you do, you will die as well. This is horrible. It's the only place I've ever called home. Lot's wife turned to look back at the burning city. In an instant, she was transformed into a pillar of salt. Only Lot and his daughters escaped God's <laughs> wrath. As morning came, Abraham walked to a hilltop to worship God. When he reached the summit, he could see the smoke from the destroyed city of Sodom as it filled the sky. As the moon follows the sun, destruction follows the wicked. My lord, give me guidance to lead my people down the path of righteousness. Little Joseph asked if this is where his grandfather lives. He does live there, Joseph. Grandfather Isaac is very old. But I pray that God has watched over him. After Isaac passed away, Jacob became the leader of the tribe. He relocated his family to the land of Canaan, and gave his sons the responsibility of caring for the sheep. But one day, Jacob's favorite son, Joseph, came to Jacob and tattled on his half-brothers. My brothers are ignoring their herd. We're losing sheep, father. Jacob took Joseph out to the fields to see for himself. You boys need to stop causing problems and be responsible. Hmm. Oh. All of you should be ashamed of yourselves, and be more like Joseph here. Thank you for telling me about your brothers, Joseph. I'm proud of you. You're welcome, Father. I'm here to do what's right for our family. Joseph's brothers became increasingly disgruntled with him. Why does Father always favor Joseph over us? He ratted us out. Next thing you know, he'll put himself in charge of the sheep, and he'll be bossing us around. I refuse to take orders from that little... Jacob had ordered Joseph to check on his brothers, and report back how things were going. I'm so sick of his attitude. He thinks he's so... Suddenly, his brothers jumped on him, ripped off his jacket, and pushed him into the well. Help me! Help! You will pay for this! Shut up, you arrogant fool! You're going to die of starvation! Ha-ha-ha-ha! <laughs> the brothers left Joseph to die. I've been thinking. If we just let Joseph die in that well, what do we get out of it? Nothing. We ought to be making some money from this situation. What are you talking about? Doesn't Amos the slave dealer come through here every sixth day? That's tomorrow. Exactly. Just as predicted, Amos the slave dealer was passing through the area. How much would you pay for this slave? But I'm not a slave. Be quiet. So, how much? Why are you selling him? He talks too much. He looks a little weak. I'll pay you 15 shekels. 20 shekels and he's all yours. Time. Joseph grew from a spoiled young boy to a diligent young man. Joseph has worked hard to become my most valuable slave. He doesn't seem like a slave. How much do you know about his past? The dealer told me he's from Canaan somewhere. The boy is not only strong, but he is smart as well. Over the years, Joseph continued to work hard. Eventually, 
Potiphar put Joseph in charge of all of the king's properties. Potiphar's wife was very attracted to Joseph. One afternoon, she approached Joseph and attempted to seduce the young slave. Hello, Joseph. I see that you've been working hard all day in this heat. You're glistening. Let me take this. Why don't you take a break next to me and tell me how you got to Egypt? I can't. I need to complete my work. If it's not done when Potiphar returns, he will be disappointed. Why do you always put Potiphar first? Because I'm his slave, and this is God's plan. I can't become unreliable. Stop! Potiphar's wife was furious at Joseph's rejection, and she plotted to get revenge. I will not be treated this way by any man. He will pay for this. As soon as Potiphar returned, his wife rushed to him with tears in her eyes. That Hebrew slave of yours held me down and tried to push his lips against mine. When I screamed for help, he ran off. Fortunately, he dropped his robe. Bring him to me now. He will be punished for this. Joseph was sent to prison. Who do we have here? Those are some pretty nice clothes you've got there, boy. Those clothes won't be that fancy once you've been in here long enough. Soon you will forget what it's like on the outside. Baker and Butler found themselves in prison for displeasing him. Night after night, the Baker and the Butler had nightmares that haunted them even while they were awake. Searching for answers, they approached Joseph. These dreams are very disturbing. Do you have any idea what they mean? Three days from now, you will be set free and your position with the Pharaoh will be restored. You will be the King's Butler once more. The only thing I ask of you is, when you speak to the Pharaoh, please ask that he set me free. I'm innocent, and I've been wrongly accused. However, two years passed, and the butler never asked the Pharaoh to release Joseph. Then one night, the Pharaoh had a terrible nightmare. <clears throat> I've had a horrible dream. No wine for me today. Is there anyone in my kingdom who can determine what these nightmares mean? Your Majesty, I know a man who can help. He's a Hebrew prisoner who explained my dream to me, and what he said came true. Well, go get him! Right away, Your Majesty. The butler rushed to have Joseph released from prison, and brought him to the Pharaoh right away. My butler tells me that you can explain my dreams. It's not me, Your Majesty. It is my god. He can explain your dream through me. Very well. From the Nile came seven hefty cows. Then seven lanky cows came and ate the hefty herd. This is a warning from God. You shall have seven seasons of excellent crops, and then seven seasons of drought. A responsible man should be in charge of storing the harvest during the first seven seasons. That way you can provide plenty of food for the kingdom during the drought. No man is more knowledgeable than you. Since you have your God, bring the officers of my court here quickly. This man is wiser than any other in my kingdom. Joseph, this ring will symbolize that you are second in command. You will act as my prime minister, and only I will have more power over Egypt. During the Seven Years of Prosperity, he became popular throughout Egypt, and the people celebrated when he married the daughter of the priest of On.
After seven years, the drought and famine quickly led to panic throughout many countries. But because of God's warning, Egypt was the only country that had food during those difficult times. People fled to Egypt with hopes of buying food for their people. Joseph, is it really you? You must despise us all for what we did to you. I believe that God brought me to Egypt so that I would have the ability to save my family and the lives of others who are suffering from the drought. How could you ever forgive us for our sins? Brothers, I forgave you long ago. When you showed up in Egypt, I had to find out if you had changed your ways. By giving yourself up for Benjamin, it proved to me that you had. I want you to go home and bring our father back to Egypt so he could be close to me. We have another five years of this drought. I will protect and provide for you all. God has truly blessed us all, brothers. The brothers hurried to Canaan. I name him Moses because he is from the river. It's a little baby. Why would someone put their son? Oh, he must be Hebrew. Poor thing. We need to find someone who can take care of him. Please, God, help me protect my boy. Miriam, is your brother safe? He's sleeping safely with mother. God surely has blessed us, but Jacobet, he's not safe with us. I have faith that God will show me how to shield our boy from the danger. The following day, Jacobet prepared a basket that would protect her son. Miriam, let me know if you see any soldiers coming. I'll have the basket ready soon. With her baby boy safely in the basket, Jacobet and Miriam hurried to the river. Miriam, I want you to keep an eye on the basket as it floats down the river. Oh, my son, it breaks my heart to send you off like this, but I have faith that God will protect you. As the basket floated away, Miriam discreetly followed it down the river toward the Pharaoh's palace. I know what to do. I shall command my soldiers to gather all the Hebrew baby boys and hurl them into the Nile. Later that evening, the soldiers of Egypt searched the homes of the Hebrews. Terrified to lose their children, the mothers and fathers jeopardized their lives to protect their boys. Amram, the Hebrew... The following day, the Pharaoh visited the site where a new building was being constructed by his workers. Your Majesty, everyone is working extremely hard, but we need more men to complete the job on time. I think the Hebrews will be great for this job. Gather them up and put them to work. This will save me money and they will not have the chance to cause any problems for Egypt. Over the years, Moses was given the life of an Egyptian prince. One day, as a young man, while riding in his chariot past a construction site, he noticed a Hebrew worker being whipped. Appalled by what he saw, Moses leapt off his chariot and confronted the taskmaster. Stop whipping that man at once. Mind your own business.
Moses has betrayed me. Guards, find him and kill him now! Moses raced across the desert and was able to reach the city of Midian before the soldiers could find him. Over the years, Moses lived a very happy life in Midian, working as a shepherd. As Moses' sheep grazed, he noticed something strange. How is it possible that this bush is on fire? Moses! Moses was certain the voice was coming from the burning bush. He stepped closer. Stay where you are. Do not come any closer. Who are you? I am the god of your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remove your sandals. You are standing on holy ground. Moses removed his sandals and knelt in fear as God spoke to him. My children are suffering in Egypt. Under my guidance, you shall lead them to a new and prosperous land of milk and honey. Why would they follow me? I am no leader. I am no prophet. Because I am God, and I am with you. My people will join you on this mountaintop, and together you will worship. But how do I persuade them? You will convince them. I created you and gave you the ability to speak. What if they don't believe what I say? They will believe you when you show them my powers. Toss your staff on the ground. Moses did as he was told. As soon as the staff hit the ground, it transformed into a poisonous viper. Terrified by this, Moses started to run away. Stop! I command you to go back and pick up the viper! Shaking with fear, Moses obeyed God's orders. The moment Moses touched the viper, it transformed back into his staff. He realized that God had given him the power to perform this marvel, and that with this miracle, he just might be able to make the Hebrews believe that God was guiding him. I am here to give you God's message. This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. Who do you think you are? Your God is no concern to me. I do not take orders from him. Now get out of here and get back to- Go back to the Pharaoh and show him the power that I have given you. Are you here to beg me to have mercy on the slaves? We are here to prove to you the power of God. <laughs> Turning a staff into a snake is a clever trick. But it's nothing my magicians can't also do. Why do you two keep harassing me? Leave me alone so I can enjoy my bath. Since you will not release the Hebrews, then you can bathe in a river of blood. <laughs> That's an easy trick for my priest. So the Pharaoh did not believe that the God of Moses was responsible. So God set forth another plague. Where are they coming from? There, there are millions of them! God tortured the people of Egypt with an infestation of gnats. They were every retaliation. God sent a plague of flies to Egypt. And as it was with all the other plagues, there were no flies in Goshen, where the Hebrews lived. Why does it matter where you praise your God? Can't you do it in Egypt? No, we cannot. We must follow God's orders. Fine. Just go and take these flies with you. Unfortunately, the Pharaoh did not keep his promise yet again. So God struck all of Egypt's livestock with an awful disease. The Pharaoh, his council, and all Egyptians everywhere broke out with hideous sores and boils from head to toe. Yet again, the Pharaoh remained hard-headed and refused to give in. All Egyptians were experiencing pain and suffering. The Pharaoh would not let the Hebrews go. Then, out of nowhere, a devastating storm hit Egypt. As the storm crashed down on Egypt, all the farmers could do was watch in fear. How many times are you going to break your promise and refuse to believe? 
Release my people, or God will destroy everything alive in Egypt with a plague of lo With God's command, a sea of locusts descended on Egypt, destroying everything in their path. Then my God shall inflict his greatest punishment. These are the words of God. At dusk, all Egyptian firstborn shall die, from the firstborn of the Pharaoh to the firstborn of the maidservant who is behind the mill, to every firstborn of every beast. There shall be a great cry of grief throughout all the land of Egypt, heard like never before. I don't believe you. Then, Pharaoh, you will beg on your hands and knees for me to lead my people, flocks and cattle, out of Egypt for good. What is it, Bobby? It is God's destroyer, an angel of death. When the sun set, God's angel of death took the life of all of Egypt's firstborn. But all of the Hebrews' homes, with the blood of a lamb painted on the front door, were passed over, just as God had promised. Your Majesty, your boy has died, and the messengers are saying that all the firstborns of Egypt have suddenly died as well. What? Not my boy! Bring me Moses and Aaron right now! It doesn't matter anymore. My boy is gone. With his only son gone, the Pharaoh no longer tried to reason with Moses. Go worship your god and leave Egypt immediately. Do not leave any of your people, cattle, or flocks behind. I want you all gone now! The next morning, Moses and his people began their journey to the land that God had promised would be their new home. Letting the Hebrews go was a mistake. Now I have no one to build for me. We might be able to stop them. Look at this map. They're headed for a dead end at the Red Sea. If we hurry, we can catch them. Ha! Those idiots! Their foolish god is sending them the... Moses, look! It's the Pharaoh's army!
Moses turned toward the Red Sea and held out his staff. Suddenly, a powerful wind blew from the east, separating the waters into two sides, creating a path for the Hebrews to follow. The Hebrews crossed the Red Sea on the path that God had created. The cloud that was preventing the Egyptian army from advancing disappeared. The Pharaoh was shocked to see that the Hebrews had escaped through a separation in the sea. After them! Bring them back to Egypt! On his command, the army charged after the Hebrews. But as they crossed the sea floor, the wet sand slowed the chariot wheels in their tracks. Moses looked back raised his staff, and suddenly, the winds grew calm. The walls of water came crashing down on the Egyptians. The Pharaoh watched in horror as his entire army drowned. Praise God! He has saved us once again! Through God, I have strength, and He is my lord happy to finally be free moses and his people were now ready to build a new life and a nation of their own we shall be called israelites this is getting absurd we don't have enough food to feed our children let alone ourselves at least in egypt we had a roof over our heads and food on the table Tonight you shall bear witness to God's power. Listen to the words of the Lord. All of you shall have meat in the evening and bread at dawn. Eat until you are full, and know that I am God. Just as God said, at dusk the sky was filled with thousands of birds that landed in the camp. doubting Moses when this is proof that God is providing for us again. You're right. The Lord has saved us many times. I will never question his power again. The Israelites continued their journey across the desert with renewed faith. They traveled toward Mount Sinai, where God first spoke to Moses. On their way, they stopped to set up camp in a valley with a stream. Moses was pleased. Ziphra, take our boys and go visit your father in Goshen. Tell him that God has set our people free and he is guiding us back home.
As the Israelites settled into their camp, a dangerous tribe lurked in the distance and planned their attack. We can easily take this camp if we invade quickly and catch them off guard. The Amalekite raiders headed for the camp. But an Israelite lookout saw them coming and called out a warning. Amalekite invaders! Amalekite invaders! Prepare for battle! Thank you, God, for helping our men defeat those evil Amalekites. Without you, it would not have been possible. Long, the people became despondent. They started abandoning their pledge to follow God's laws. They wanted a symbol of some kind. The people gave Aaron all of their pieces of gold and jewelry. Aaron melted it down and constructed a gleaming golden calf. Amazing! It's so similar to one of the gods people of Egypt worship. This is no accident. This must be the true God. We shall have a feast tomorrow to honor our new Lord. Pam, he was shocked by what he found. He loudly smashed the stone tablets. And the people immediately stopped celebrating. <gasps> you have broken the covenant with God. You pledged to worship only him. Yet you have replaced him with us. As the people of Israel gathered around the base of Mount Sinai, God spoke out to them. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. You must obey these ten commandments. You shall worship no other gods before me. You shall not make, create, or bow down to any man-made idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not hurt. shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall... And you shall not be jealous of your neighbor or other people's possessions. Two messengers from Moses' camp traveled to King Sion's kingdom and requested to see him. Your Majesty, Moses, the leader of our people would like your permission for us to cross through your lands. 
We won't take anything I or... know who you people are. I will never give you permission. Go away and never come... I fear they may attack us now. We should prepare. At dawn, the forces of King Sion attacked. But they were shocked to find that the Israelites were already prepared to fight. One more time, the people had arrived outside the Promised Land. But now the Israelites had no fear. They whispered about the cattle they'd like to raise and the quiet houses they'd like to build. However, Moses wasn't as thrilled. He brought everyone together for a message. I have reached 120 years of age. I'm afraid I can't guard you any longer. Besides, the Lord has also banned me from setting foot in the Promised Land. As such, God makes way for someone new to follow. It is Joshua. Gather around him. The Israelites applauded for their new leader. Joshua's devotion to God had definitely paid off. And suddenly, God opened his mouth to affirm Joshua's position. Joshua, remain brave. Your leadership will see the Israelites into the Promised Land. It is a place rich with food and resources, Not to mention that I will always be there. After that, the elderly Moses ascended Mount Nebo and looked upon the fields and forests his people would live in. Up on that mountain, where he was isolated with the Lord, he passed away. God personally laid him to rest. And even still, nobody has any idea where his remains reside.